Hello, we welcome you to our Bible study today. We'll be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1 through 18. The first point tonight is exhortation to sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 1 through 8. Verse 1, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Paul urged and exhorted the brethren in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ to, quote, abound more and more. Other versions read, excel still more and do more and more. The brethren had received how they ought to walk and were so walking. One version reads, just as you actually do walk. He urged strongly, showing the importance of what he was saying, that they do even more. How does one know how to walk and to please God? One would need to know the will of God. The word that the brethren heard from Paul, they welcomed, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, as Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. The term ought here suggests a moral obligation. These are things that they ought to do. They ought to walk or conduct themselves in a way that is pleasing to God. Verse 2, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Paul reminded them of the what commandments they gave the brethren through the Lord Jesus, or by the authority of the Lord Jesus. The term commandments here suggests something received from a superior. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37, when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he said, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things which I write to you, that they are the commandments of the Lord. Paul claimed that the gospel he preached, quote, came by revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1, verses 11 to 12. He taught the gospel not as coming from men, but as coming from God. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 13. Verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Paul urged them to do more in how they walked and pleased God, as we saw in verse 1. Now Paul expounds upon the will of God. It was God's will that they live in holiness. The term sanctification describes the state of being sanctified or set apart for holiness. Paul later writes, For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Verse 7. First, it was God's will that they should, quote, abstain from sexual immorality. That is, avoid fornication which is itself a form of moral uncleanness. Jesus taught that fornications defile men, Matthew 15, 19, and Math Mark chapter 7 and verse 21. From passages like Hebrews 13 and 4, we see that while sex in marriage is said to be undefiled, outside of marriage will be judged, Hebrews 13 and 4. Ephesians 5 and verse 3, it says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. And so according to Paul, sexual immorality or fornication is not fitting for saints. The Greek word here for abstain means to hold oneself off, according to fair and strong. To abstain is to choose to do or have something, to restrain deliberately and often with an effect of self-denial from an action or practice. And so the idea here of abstaining, to choose not to do something, 
to exercise self-control. And so Paul urged the brethren to abstain from these practices. Verse 4, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Paul taught them to abstain from sexual immorality, verse 3, and that he said that each should know how to, quote, possess his own vessel. Another version reads, control his own body. And so exercise self-control, discipline. The term vessel was commonly used as a metaphor for the body. This should be done in sanctification and honor. Another version reads, in a way that is holy and honorable. The term here for vessel, as I mentioned, is a metaphor for one's body. And so the text reads, possess his own vessel or control his, his own body. Sometimes the word vessels is used to describe both the husband and the wife, as we see in 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. Paul spoke of people as being in earthen vessels, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7. And so while in this particular text, vessel here refers to the body, that one know how to control his own body, there are times that vessel can be referred to in referring to a wife. And so one version reads, take a wife for himself. However, in this passage, we see that possess his own vessel or control his own body is so used. Verse five, not in passion or love of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. And so Paul taught that they abstain from these things, knowing how to control themselves. The opposite should be, or would be, living in passion of lust. The Gentiles, particularly the heathens, or the pagans of the Gentiles, lived with unbridled sexual desire. And so according to Paul, those who advocate living according to the passion of lust do not know God. The restriction here is on premarital and extramarital affairs, according to Paul here in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8. Verse 6, that no one should take advantage of or defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. Paul warned against these practices, saying that no one should take advantage of or exploit another person. That is, they should not transgress against another. No one should defraud or deprive another of his rights or her rights by some deliberate perversion of the truth. There are those who would say what they need to say in order to get what they want. Another version reads wrong here in this passage. Paul warned that the Lord is the avenger of all such. That is, those who are being taken advantage of, being exploited, being wronged, being transgressed against in this way. Paul said that God will avenge all those who are transgressed or wronged in this fashion. Hebrews chapter 13 and 4, the writer said, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Verse 7 for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. God, according to this passage, called us to live in holiness. He did not call us for the purpose of impurity. According to Paul, we ought to abstain from immorality and live holy and pure lives. The Apostle Peter also wrote on this topic in 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16, where he said, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but he's, as he who called you is holy, you be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And verse 8, he concludes with the paragraph on exhortation to sanctification saying therefore he who rejects this does not reject man 
but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Paul had taught them how they ought to walk and to please God, verse 1. They knew the commandments that had been given by the Lord, verse 2, that it was the will of God that they abstain from sexual immorality, verse 3. Therefore, he who regards, rejects this word, does not merely reject man, but according to Paul, he rejects God. He rejects or he disregards the word of God. We note earlier how that the people of Thessalonica, those who believed and obeyed, these are those who received and welcomed the word, not as the word of men, but as it was in their mind, in their estimation, truth, the word of God. The word that the brethren heard from Paul they welcomed, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. First Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. Uh, also look at the first verse we noted today, First Thessalonians 4 and verse 1. And so first we have an exhortation to sanctification, encouragement to live holy lives, set apart for holiness as Christians. Now, number two, we see an exhortation to love and to work. Verses 9 to 12. Verse 9, he said, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Paul graciously writes how it was really unnecessary to admonish them to love one another, as they themselves were taught by God to love one another, and he was confident that they surely would follow the teachings of God. Verse 10. The teachings of God is brotherly love, or love of the brethren. With family, there is love. And so, as brothers and sisters in Christ, a part of the family of God, they were called to love one another as family in Christ. Here's another reference to the commandments as coming from God, not man. He said, you are taught by God to love one another. And so, Paul is not claiming to be the originator of this message. Instead, he's saying that message came from God. Verse 10, And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in Mas all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. And so here in verse 10, they were taught by God to love one another, and they surely did love all the brethren in all Macedonia. Other versions read, all the brothers and all of God's family. However, Paul urged them to excel in practicing love, to increase more and more in love. Verse 11, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Later in the second epistle to the Thessalonians, Paul will write how he heard in 2 Thessalonians 3.11 that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. And so sometime later, after he wrote the first epistle, he wrote the second, and we see that there were some among the Thessalonians, the brethren, the church at Thessalonica, who were walking in a disorderly manner, who were not working, and who he described as being busy bodies. And so they walked in a disorderly manner or they were idle and disruptive. He exhorted those who did so that they, quote, work in quietness and eat their own bread. Second Thessalonians 3 and 12. Now in this passage, we see in verse 11, that he exhorts the brethren here to aspire or to make it their aspirations, their ambition in life, to first lead a quiet life. In writing to Timothy, he tells him to pray that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, First Timothy 2 and verse 2. So very similar to what we see here in the letter to the Thessalonians as he did with his letter to 
to the evangelist Timothy to pray that they may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And now here, the first exhortation to lead a quiet life. He may be calling for the brethren here to live inconspicuously and to avoid public controversies. And so rather than causing commotions and disruptions, walking in disorderly, he calls for them to lead a quiet life. And as he told Timothy, to pray that we may live a quiet and peaceable life. Second, Paul says here, mind your own business. This is a common idiom today. Other versions read, attend to your own business or mind your own affairs. And so the thought here is, manage yourselves. With the busy body, they were busy, but they were busy about everybody else's business. Paul urges them to mind their own business, attend to their own affairs, manage themselves. And so he's saying, do not be meddlesome in the affairs of others. Have a respect for other people's privacy. Third, Paul exhorts, work with your own hands. So rather than eating the bread of others, work for your own bread, for your own needs. Verse 12, he says that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. By so doing, he says, you may walk properly. Contrast that to walking disorderly in 2 Thessalonians 3.11. Do these things so that you may have a good reputation and set a good example toward people who are outside of Christ. Work with your own hands, he said, that you may lack nothing or that you may not be in need of anything, that you may not be dependent on anyone. Colossians 4 and verse 5, Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, and he said, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Use your time to the best of your ability. Make the most of your opportunities. And so walk wisely, conduct yourself wisely, in this case, particularly towards those who are outside, or outside the congregation, the, the church of our, of our Lord Jesus. Of course, one should walk properly among those who are in the church as well as outside. Number three, the last point, in addition to exhortation to love and work, he calls for them to have encouragement knowing about the coming of Christ. And so he comforts them with these words in verses 13 to 18. Paul said in this passage, verse 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. And so Paul said that he did not want the brethren to be ignorant or uninformed. He wanted them to know concerning those who have fallen asleep or about those who sleep in death. Sleep was a, a common euphemism for death. Jesus used this euphemism in John 11 and 13, where he talked about death as sleep. Do not grieve for your fellow Christians, Paul thought, who have died as unbelievers without hope. And so while unbelievers, those outside, may have no hope of, of life beyond this life, as believers, Paul said, you have hope. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. There is hope for those who believe in Jesus, who believe that Jesus not only died, he died for our sins, and that he rose again, giving hope to his followers. There is hope for those who have died in Christ, those who sleep in Jesus, who have died faithful to him. Revelation 14, 13, John the apostle wrote, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. What will happen to those who have died and Jesus has not yet returned? You believe that Jesus rose, died and rose again, 
Even so, you ought to believe that God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. You can also look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he describes the resurrection and the evidence for the resurrection of Christ. In both places, Paul proves the resurrection by his own resurrection, the resurrection of Christ. Verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. And so Paul sets their minds at ease. One is not going to have an advantage over the other. Paul said, for we say to this, say to you by the word of the Lord. And so here we see a, a claim of inspiration. As he has before, he says again that he was not writing by his own wisdom, his own knowledge. Those who remain alive for the coming of the Lord, he said, will not proceed those who have already died. So there will be no advantage for those who are alive when Christ returns over those who have already died and sleep in Christ. Some try to make the we out in this passage in verse 15. He says that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, they make the we out to mean that Paul is claiming that he would still be alive when the Lord will come again. However, Paul himself knew that no one knows when the Lord will return. He said in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 2, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord will so come as a thief in the night. And so this expression signifying that, that he would come unexpectedly at a time not previously announced. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 2, we see that he, he speaks of the unexpected return of the Lord. Yes, he would return, and they knew he would return, but they did not know when he would return. In fact, Paul believed that he would die soon, as we see in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6. And so there's nothing to indicate that Paul or the other believers here are saying that the second coming of Christ would come in their day. Of course, for all he knew, he, he could have come in his day while he was alive. The we in the passage where he talks about we who are alive and remain, he includes all brethren. And so all the brethren who are alive and remain when the Lord returns will by no means precede those who have already died in the Lord, died in Jesus, those who are asleep in Christ. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And so the Lord, Jesus, will come from heaven, Paul taught. He'll come by the power of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. As Paul wrote earlier in verse 15, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. The only other time that we see the term archangel mentioned and an archangel mentioned by name is that of Michael, the archangel in Jude 1 and verse 9. Michael, the archangel, um, the trumpet here, as trumpets were often used, would sound at important events, and certainly no greater event than the coming of, of the Lord. The Bible teaches in John 5, 28 and 29, and also Acts 24 and 15, that there is one resurrection, the general resurrection, not one for the just and another one for the un unjust. There's one resurrection for the just and for the unjust, for everyone, as we see in John 5, 28 and 29. And so here you have the picture of the Lord returning, the Lord coming from heaven, the Lord by his authority calling, calling out to the people, and the people are rising to meet him by his divine authority, his power. Acts 1.11 speaks of the ascension of Christ, but also speaks of the second coming of Christ. It says, Who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so here we have in Acts 1 verse 11. 
1 Corinthians 15 and 52, the chapter I mentioned earlier on the resurrection says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Those who sleep in Jesus will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will be caught up, according to Paul, together with them to meet the Lord. Here he is reassuring them that their brothers and sisters who have died in Christ will not be left out. Acts 1 and verse 11, as we read earlier. And so we shall always be with the Lord. And so here we see the, the hope of being with the Lord in heaven. Verse 18, therefore, comfort one another with these words. As the brethren would face persecution, these words would be words of, of comfort, knowing that if they died, even if they died now, that they would live again and when the Lord returns. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So, so as not to worry, not to be troubled, Paul encourages the brethren with what we find here in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verses 1 to 18. We hope that this lesson has been helpful. We would encourage you to continue to study and study on your own and, and come back again and, and study with us. We hope that you have a, a wonderful day. And until next time, God bless.